Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's time once again for another curating your movie library. And I think now that we're two years in, I've pretty much lost that bad habit of saying cultivating and getting curating right. It's curating your movie library. Uh, And that means that I'm happy to welcome on uh, the program once again my precious wife, Lisa. Welcome, sweetheart. Thank you. Now, we've talked uh, off and on about sort of the process that we tend to go through when we're looking for something to watch. We talked about your propensities and my propensities and that you like that, which is gentle. Uh, And I like being surprised. Mm -hmm. And we came across on Prime uh, a couple of uh, cozies. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about cozies on the show before. Cozy is a typically a murder mystery where there's not a lot of gore, there's not a lot of violence, Mm -hmm. it's much more sort of the murder happens off screen Mm -hmm. and you see see what happens. So you've got these two uh, things that we've watched and we're going to do one today and another one uh, probably next week. So the the first one, or actually the second one that we watched uh, is called The ABC Murders. Mm -hmm. And uh, it stars... Uh, John Malkovich, Mm -hmm. and this is going to be harder to get right than Cultivate versus Curate, but it stars John Malkovich as Hercule Poirot. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are an Agatha Christie fan, you know that there are basically three kinds of Agatha Christie stories. There are Miss Marple stories, where the... uh, person who solves the mysteries is this older woman, often in movies played by Helen Hayes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's this Belgian uh, detective, Hercule Poirot, mm-hmm. uh, in, in a second set. And then the rest of them are sort of neither one of those two. Mm-hmm. Um, so Poirot is this detective from uh, Belgium, but he's living in England. And uh, this is the story, sort of, uh, almost like uh, one of the more recent Rocky movies, in the sense that Poirot is now older. Mm-hmm. He has sort of fallen out of favor. All the people who looked up to him have kind of forgotten him. He's kind of washed up. And this case kind of lands in his lap, and he has the opportunity to come back. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of angst in it for Mm -hmm. Poirot. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I've read uh, multiple Poirot stories, and my perception of him as a reader was always uh, that he was sort of comical uh, in his pridefulness and his vanity. He's always talking about his his mustaches. Um, But he was played pretty dark by Malkovich. Mm And in a a compelling way, and we get a little bit more backstory from him as well, which was very interesting. Now, one of the hardships about talking about these is we can't give anything away, (laughs) especially on these mysteries. We don't want to do any spoilers. But tell me a little bit about, you know, what you found appealing about this particular one. This particular murder mystery really had you going. You really believed the person that they were, that was pretty much the star of the entire show, Mm -hmm. was the person that was going to be found as the murderer. Yeah, it was, it was, not only was Poirot disorienting, because he wasn't at least what I envisioned him as, but I'm thinking, I don't remember ever having a Agatha Christie story where the reader knows in advance, because that's one, there's two different ways to do this. Mm -hmm. One, the reader knows in advance, and you get to watch the detective unpack it. Mm -hmm. The other way is you don't know either until it's unpacked. And it's always been the latter. And it very much looked like the former this time. And that's enough of a giveaway. 
uh, we, we won't tell you who it is or how it was, but uh, we are already telling you. Yeah, the person they make you think it is, not them. And this is well, not a let mild. Let me ask you a question you about Poirot. Yeah. Is in the other books or series that you've seen him in, does he always have these flashbacks? Because in this story, it's part of the theme of the story where his flashbacks is actually taking him back into engaging with a particular family in the community. And it happens to be connected to the murder. Right, exactly. And no, And that is We don't new. really know why he's having these flashbacks. Well, yeah, that. and the thing is, there's a... One, that, yes, that is not a common thing. Two, however, you get a real sense of the whole uh, Sherlock Holmes versus, uh, who's the bad guy in Sherlock Holmes? Not My, Mycroft is the brother. The bad guy is um, the evil genius. I can't remember his name. Okay. Uh, but there, there are Sherlock Holmes stories where he's engaged in a battle of wits with sort of the anti-Sherlock uh, Holmes, mm -hmm. just as smart as Holmes, only he's evil. Well, this is presented as a, you know, that Poirot is called out mm -hmm. and invited in because this murderer uh, is wanting to see if he can pull the wool over the eyes of this great former detective. And so that's how there's a connection between uh, Poirot's life uh, because the, the ABC murders, I think we can say this without giving too much away. Uh, the ABC murders uh, are done. The first victim was killed in a town that began with A. And the victim's uh, initials were AA. Mm -hmm. And the next one was a town that began with B. And the initials of victims were BB, etc. And because of this, you, you think that's all there is to it, but we also discover that this, these are all places all... that Poirot has been. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he didn't even know that he had been at one of the places right. until later in the story he figures it out. Oh, yes, I have been there. Um, so very engaging, very in, uh, uh, surprising. Yeah, you know, I love that when I don't know what's yeah. happening. Uh, and it, it's a three-parter. Uh, I think it's a good length. It's not too long. It's not too short. Uh, John Malkovich uh, is a, does an excellent job. And he's an accomplished actor. Yes, uh, the proposed villain is also really creepy. He, he is. We're sorry yeah. to say. He yeah. does a very good creepy yeah. job. Well, we'd encourage you to check it out. It's on Prime Video, yes, the ABC Murders. Thank you, sweetheart, for being with Thank me. Thank you, honey. As I am recording, we are between Election Day and the formal announcement of a winner. I don't know what's going to happen when that winner is announced. I know that a lot of people are going to be profoundly unhappy uh, one way or another. Different people, but either way, a lot of people are going to be profoundly unhappy. Now, I raise uh, this election season to highlight the principles that guide the work of Dunamis Fellowship and the work of the Jesus Changes Everything podcast. Our meaning, our reason, our central idea is right there in our title, Jesus Changes Everything. One of the things that I've noticed, not having done a particularly careful job because I don't really know how, but even an idiot like me can discern that when political topics show up in the podcast, my listenership rises. I've also noticed on the contrary side that whenever Lisa shows up on the podcast, my listenership rises. That I understand. That doesn't surprise me. But we're not here simply to be yet another political uh, outlet 
I don't see myself or this work as being principally about politics. It's true that I have a background uh, and have done some uh, teaching on issues of economics. It's true that I see a deep connection between government interference and damage to our economy and ethics and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and that's part of why we do this. We, we talk about these things because Jesus does change everything. But it's always my hope to be able to say something uh, in the podcast when we deal with political issues to help us remember foundational truths about the Christian faith that will keep us grounded in difficult and tumultuous times. I've seen others do it. It's absolutely true and needs to be said over and over again. Uh, it's that sermon which we should be preaching to ourselves right now, that Jesus is on his throne. I had somebody ask, well, I know Jesus is sovereign, uh, and I know that he chooses who our president is, but what if there was voter fraud and cheating, etc.? Did Jesus ordain that? And the answer is yes. Of course he did. That Jesus chooses who will be our president doesn't undo the fact that Jesus also chooses how it will come to pass. He's sovereign, sovereign over all things. What I can do is have a faithful biblical response to the circumstances that God has ordained. What I can teach is encouragement for others to do the same. This doesn't mean, by the way, that I don't think it's important who ends up serving as president or that the terrible things that can happen uh, if the Democrats get into power aren't terrible things. I agree, they are. But they're terrible things in God's hand for the well-being of his people. We have this propensity to allow our spirits to be formed and shaped by the daily news rather than the eternal word of God. And what I want to do on the Jesus Changes Everything podcast is not just talk about the daily news, but to talk about the eternal word of God, which is why... <laughs> Again, we continue to look for partners. We've had uh, some increase of the number of people who are supporting us uh, with one-time gifts and, and monthly, but we are uh, still a long, long way from being able to uh, actually support uh, this ministry. We're still a long, long way uh, from those of us who work doing this ministry from actually getting some sort of financial uh, payment for doing so. Uh, we're still, in a sense, doing this on our own dime. But we're happy to do so as long as we're able to do so. Uh, but we're asking, we're asking God if he would be pleased to encourage enough of you to come behind us, to support us financially, that we could do this uh, without having to find other things to do to put food on the table. There's a chance for you to vote. You can vote with your dollars. You can vote, is this worth it? Is this not worth it? Is this a podcast that can help center me, that can help ground me and root me in God's word? Have I found this to be uh, enjoyable enough that I want to listen in, informative enough that I'm learning, but also faithful enough to the Word of God that I'm maturing, that I'm being remade into the image of Christ in part through this podcast? If that describes how you feel about what we're doing, I'm asking you please to consider, prayerfully consider coming alongside us. That is what we're trying to do. It's what we hope to do. It's what we hope to continue to do. Thank you again for listening. We Protestants tend to have something of a love-hate relationship with 
St. Thomas Aquinas. On the one hand, as Protestants, we value theological brilliance. We admire deeply the mind of Thomas, perhaps even dreaming that had he lived in our day, he surely would have been one of us. On the other hand, as Protestants, we, well, protest. That is to say, that brilliant mind was likewise noticed and put to use by Rome. Thomas was a brilliant theologian for the Church of Rome. Brilliant we love. Church of Rome, not so much. We could spend some time arguing about how good or how bad Thomas's theology was. I love and admire the man, however, for an altogether better reason. It is because we are a proud people that we rejoice in brilliant minds. What truly commends Thomas, however, was not his brilliant mind, but his humble heart. That heart is brought front and center in one legendary story about Thomas during his student days. The story begins with Thomas entering a classroom. The professor is not yet there, but most of the students are. They're all, however, by the window, craning their necks with excitement. Thomas asks what they're looking at so intently. Thomas, come quick! There are pigs flying. Thomas rushes to the window only to be met by the uproarious laughter of his fellow students. As the laughter dies down, Thomas gently but potently exposes their sin by saying simply, I would rather believe that pigs could fly than that my friends would lie to me. We can, if we are imbued with the spirit of the age, mock such a trusting attitude. We can scorn such credulity. We can even baptize our cynicism with supporting biblical texts. Come on now, Thomas. Don't you know we are to be harmless as doves, but as wise as serpents? Matthew ten sixteen. Or we can see it for what it is an expression of that godly character which made Thomas a great man. We can see it as that which we should be most zealous to emulate in his life. Another great and brilliant man of God taught me this when I was a young student. I was a sophomore in high school and deeply and profoundly sophomoric. That is, I thought myself wise and invested time and energy in cultivating that image. I dressed in black. I listened to ponderous lyrics from esoteric rock bands. I wrote morbid poetry about walls and masks and worms. My father gave me in one fell swoop a rebuke and a challenge. He said to me, son, the cheapest way to develop the reputation as an intellectual is to adopt the posture of a cynic. What I want is not a reputation as either an intellectual or a cynic. What I want is a reputation for following our Lord Jesus. What I want is a simplicity that cares not a whit about reputation at all. What I want is a guilelessness in my own heart that is so grounded that I expect nothing but guilelessness in my fellow believers. What I want is not to be known as a great theologian, a great man of God, but to be known by God as a humble child of His. All of which means, in short, that what I want is to seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. Our battles, friends, for reputation, in the end are battles to build and expand our own kingdoms. 
We want to be the smartest guy in the room. Then we want to be the smartest guy in the church. Then we want to be the smartest guy we know. We want to be the king of Smartavia. Even if we don't worry about what we will eat or what we will wear, as those to whom Jesus spoke did, we do worry about what people will think, or worse, that they might not think of us at all. The world tells us this is how our life will have meaning. This is how we can have significance. The world tells us that pigs are ever and always earthbound. But Jesus calls us to believe him. He tells us that if we seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, then we will receive all we could ever want or need. He tells us if we will delight ourselves in him, he will give us the desires of our heart. The question isn't whether we are smart enough to understand what he has said. The question is whether we are humble enough to submit to what he has said. I suspect that when Thomas went on to his reward, he did not cast before the Lord that crown that was his reputation for theological and apologetic brilliance. I suspect that he threw that out long before he got there. Instead, the crown he cast before that glassy sea was something valuable the glory of his humility. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsportjr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.